Hi, everyone. I'm Doug Black, Chief at Inside HPC. And I'd like to thank the ISC Conference for inviting us to offer this panel discussion today. We bring together three HPC luminaries for a discussion on the theme of HPC in 2030, greater power, greater potential, greater peril. Um, now, with me as panel moderator is my at HPC podcast partner, Shaheen Khan. He is founding partner and analyst at the OrionX.net technology consulting firm. Um, on our panel, we have Michael Resch, director of the Performance Computing Center, Stuttgart. Uh, we have Rick Stevens, associate lab director and Argonne Distinguished Fellow at Argonne National Laboratory. And we have Jeff Better. He is section head of advanced computing systems research at Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, so, uh, I've asked each of our panelists to share their thoughts on the potential upsides and downsides of supercomputing by the end of the decade. And um, why don't we start with the potential positives? Uh, Michael, starting with you, you've said the end of Moore's law is not the end of supercomputing. And you also say that HPC will be more driven by software than by hardware by 2030. What are your what are your thoughts on these areas? Well, honestly, um, what what I've seen or experienced in my center over the last uh, probably 25, 30 years or so is that uh, because of the drive that hardware has given to HPC because of the continued increase of speed by buying new hardware, um, software was probably less important. Uh, that doesn't mean that people did not care about software, but it basically means that if, if you had a new system, it would make sense to invest probably three to six months, maybe a year to optimize, and then you would go into production and, and make sure that your code is running. Um, now, with the end of Moore's law, you sort of take away some of that acceleration which gives people more time to focus on the software aspects. Because when, when I look at the speed of current systems, what we see is a tremendous peak performance, but a relatively low sustained level of performance. And, and my hope is that uh, after sort of having harvested hardware uh, speed increase over the last 40 years or so, we might be uh, able to still harvest on the software and on the methods, on the algorithms, uh, mathematical methods, and all of this. So my hope is that we will shift slightly from hardware to software with our focus, um, and that this will still give us uh, an increase in performance that is relevant, important, and will help us to solve some of the problems. Okay, yeah, one of my favorite quotes, uh, I think I heard this first from Steve Conway at Hyperion is um, in HPC, hardware is easy, software is hard. And uh, so um, now over to you, Rick, you say uh, an upside could be the use of AI for HPC simulations. Tell us about the potential in that area. Well, we think that the more and more traditional HPC applications are gonna be augmented with a technique that's uh, sometimes called uh, AI surrogates or machine learning surrogates. And so this idea is that you take your kernel functions in your application and you train uh, typically deep neural net models to um, and then uh, dynamically you're deciding whether uh, you can use the original code or the function. Uh, but when we do that for many applications, we get a huge boost in, in uh, you know, in throughput or, or in a time to solution. So anywhere from a thousand to a million to a billion fold uh, improved performance. Um, and I think this is going to be a common practice, probably even built into compilers and built into uh, software frameworks uh, by 2030. So this means that even if we were continuing to increase the speed of hardware, that the effective performance of some applications is going to be orders of magnitude faster than we would have uh, obtained just from the hardware boost. So that's going to affect everything from how we use HPC for climate or drug development or material science or, you know, dozens of new applications. But I think that's going to be a huge change, the integration of machine learning and traditional, you know, mod sim techniques uh, will be in full swing by 2030. Okay, and um, 
You've also talked about AI and classical machine writing and optimizing uh, quantum computing programs and circuits. Yeah, so, you know, writing programs for quantum computers is really hard. Thinking of quantum algorithms is hard, but but even once you've got an algorithm and you're trying to express it as a quantum circuit, there's many, many possible uh, versions of that quantum circuit that computes the same thing. And so um, I think uh, probably much sooner than 2030 that we'll, we'll start seeing uh, AI augmented uh, software environments for quantum computers where hopefully you'll be able to um, you know, use an interface that's more similar to a, a current, you know, math library. But what's going to happen under the covers is a huge amount of optimization and tuning and perhaps synthesis of the quantum circuits from uh, AI driven models and some kind of machine learning driven models. So I think that's going to happen considerably before 2030. But I don't think humans are going to write the majority of quantum programs. I think that's going to be written by machines. Right. So few people understand quantum to begin with. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure it's about a question of understanding. It's a question of tedium, right? I mean, you can understand how they work, but, um, you know, the way you program current quantum computers is like writing machine code. Um, and if you have to both invent the algorithm and write machine code, uh, you're not very productive. And what we need to keep uh, the expansion of interest in quantum computing alive and really to prove it out, assuming we can get things to work, is, is going to be a huge amount of algorithm development and exploration. And we just can't afford to do that in the way that we programmed you know, machines in the 1940s by writing you know, machine code. We've got to do it with much, much higher level tools. OK. Um, uh, now, Jeff, um, your potential upsides you were looking at are supercomputing and the service of personal health. You also mentioned um, a term I had not heard, digital twins as a lightweight metaverse. Yes. Uh, which sounds very interesting. Please yeah. uh, so, expand. Uh, I wanted to bounce off of uh, uh, Rick's comment there about uh, automation of computing itself and just make a couple comments on that first. The, you know, it's hard to program systems these days. I don't know how many people have sat down recently to just try and write a program from scratch for some of our existing systems. But it's a it's a very tedious process, and I'd like to see some of these uh, automation technologies just make that easier. I mean, you have tools like CMake and containers and batch scheduling systems and many different compilers, and and it's just very tedious. And so, I would like to see some of that technology uh, there. Um, as far as the the digital twins go, I mean. You know, I think in practice, a lot of people think this, a lot of engineers think this way uh, from the start. They're always building models and simulations of what they're trying to create. And it would be nice to have uh, more automated infrastructure for that. So if I'm, uh, you know, building a, a you know, a, a new computer or a new plane or a new uh, uh, building, that, that it's as automated as possible so that you can you can uh, prune errors quickly you can uh, understand where the design constraints are you can evaluate them quickly and and in a collaborative way and then uh, you know push the print button for lack of a better word and and have it built for you and and i think you know if you look at if you look at some of the large hpc companies um, and they're excited about this because the role of modeling and simulation is critical to that type of infrastructure, as is uh, the collaboration and, and sensing part of computing that, that, you know, HPC hasn't played such a big role in. Right, exactly. Okay. Um, now, if we, um, does anybody want to expand on any of these points? I actually had a question for all the panelists is that there's always been this balance of portability versus performance. And are the best days of portability and performance behind us after the whole end of Moore's law and everything becoming more, uh, more optimized in a very specific application kind of a way? Yeah, there's a lot of opinions on that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So who, who wants to go first? Jeff, well, I'm just wondering what my opinion is. I mean, one one thing I think is going to be the case is that we're, you know, in the past, portability mattered a lot because you had so much diversity in 
underlying you know computer architectures, lots of different CPUs, lots of different uh, system architectures, and porting was you know something that people dreaded, and and portability helps, right? It's possible in the future that we'll collapse down around just a couple of, des of point designs, and uh, it'll be you know kind of odd that people even remember that portability was a problem. That would be one possible future scenario. Another possible future scenario, it's going to get a lot, lot worse, right? If we get uh, systems that have varying amounts of AI acceleration, matrix acceleration, quantum acceleration, other kinds of you know ASIC things to where there's divergence, <laughs> massive divergence, then uh, it could be that the future is a Tower of Babel, right? Everything is about porting. Um, but then to Jeff's point uh, about soft, you know, automation helping us out, um, you know, maybe it becomes the purview not of humans, but of our AI, you know, helpers uh, to handle the pesky details of porting from one system to the next. As long as I can express what I want in some, you know, clear top level spec, the rest of it will just happen. And I don't even know which of those two paths I believe. <laughs> right. So I, uh, I'll chime in quickly. And, it, and, and I think, um, Michael already commented on the software part of it. So, you know, we had this uh, report or uh, workshop a few years ago in DOE about extreme heterogeneity. And, and the, you know, kind of the premise there was that, that you know, vendors are, are all going to be using just a handful of fabs. And the, the way they're going to discriminate their, their products from one another is through architectural diversity. And so they're going to add more domain specific features to their processors, to their nodes, so that they'll optimize for specific workloads. And, and in that scenario, you see, uh, you know, the potential for a lot of diversity. And that doesn't even think about the open hardware movement where people are, are you know, some people are even thinking about open hardware in, in a, a, you know, a, a 3D printing type of way where you, you just build it at home and, and upload the the description file and, and the chip gets built for you, right? Um, if you scroll back and just think about what we're going to see in the next five years, it's likely we'll see something like an FPGA and, and uh, in a node and a GPU in a node and a maybe a DSP in a node. And, and we've looked at uh, chips like Snapdragon that have that diversity. And it's very, uh, it's very challenging to get everything properly aligned so that you get high performance on it. And that, and that is, um, uh, you know, going beyond just the functional portability that you have across those systems. So I, I think this is a, one of the major challenges we have. That sounds sort of like a composability on steroids kind of. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Uh, great stuff. So now moving over to the dark side of HPC, um, Rick, you're concerned with small groups, as you described it in a kind of a neutral way, um, using HPC for nefarious purposes, weapons, uh, and and deep fake. Yeah, I mean, to the degree that to the degree that we're you know, ten years from now or something like that, we're let's say metaverse is quasi successful. Although I, I think this video is showing what a lo-fi metaverse connection might look like for me, um, that, uh, you know, we've, we've had a policy in the US and other Western countries partially to manage the flow of technology to adversaries. And that was assuming that, you know, hardware was really the trick. Um, but as we're seeing, and this is really a, just a flip side of my first point, you know, about uh, surrogates and so on, is that we're seeing the ability for really clever people to get factors of say 20 million or more a billion out of out of uh, what amounts to just you know smarter way of thinking about software and that's going to disrupt uh who's able to do what whether it's for designing you know new forms of weapons or, or biological threats or chemical threats or whatever um so there's going to be that kind of proliferation you know we think of nuclear non-proliferation as a thing that we manage and we try to have treaties about chemical weapons and biological weapons, but we haven't really thought of HPC technology other than just the hardware building blocks, maybe as something we have to worry about proliferation, could turn into having to worry about AI um, or AI models as something that you don't want to proliferate. So that could be a, a, a pretty sobering 
future. I don't know how do we prevent it exactly. Another one is that, um, you know, and this is again, just spinning on AI, this is not, this is gonna happen. This is some version of this, I think will happen and we'll just have to see what, what we do about it, which is, um, you know, fairly soon, uh, it'll be nearly impossible to distinguish between real media and generated media, whether it's narratives, video, this interview could be completely right. uh, fake and so on. And if you do that with a, with a, you know, now it's a stunt, but if you do it with, with deliberate intent um, and you flood the internet with what amounts to, uh, you know, not, you know, really flood the internet, like with 99% of the content is fake, um, then you effectively destroy it as a as a vehicle for uh, you know interaction or commerce or whatever. I think this is kind of what was behind Elon's tweet the other day about you know authenticating humans and throwing out the bots. But I mean, um, I think that's likely to happen. Um, you know, if, if all these guys get tired of of uh, uh, crypto mining and turn all the uh, processors that we you know have for crypto mining into uh you know internet internet fake uh, media posts or something then you could you could have this right and and i think that's something that is pretty much ungovernable at the moment um and you know we have to think about that and, and the solution is not you know some kind of internet you know n.0 that's you know got blockchain that, that that's can't be the solution because blockchain turns everything into an inefficient pile of nonsense but you know something more clever than that. <clears throat> I don't know. I want Jeff to beat that. So Jeff, what's your downside? <laughs> well, you I mentioned for Doug. Yeah, you well, mentioned I, Bitcoin. I, I did want to say that my own little <clears throat> homegrown thought was maybe maybe blockchain could be the solution here. But you've already <laughs> shot no. That I, down, so. I I don't think it's a solution to anything really. <clears throat> personally, okay. okay. Well, just to follow up on that Bitcoin, I'll segue here to to one of my downsides, and that's just this insatiable appetite for computing really makes the climate worse, right? And uh, and you know, Bitcoin is an example of that. Machine learning is an example of that. Uh, we've seen talks by Google and Facebook and, and various uh, data center companies that that just you know have massive facilities that use massive amounts of power to to do things like machine learning and, and social networking. And that's something that we're in some ways a victim of our own success. You know, a lot, a lot of the technology is, is something that people want to use and, and kind of where's the, the boundary for that? What's the upper limit that we can deal with? And I think that's where DOE and, and other uh, scientists can play a role by coming up with more efficient computing technology so people can continue to do what they want to do. And it's not, it's, you know, uh, carbon neutral, let's say, let's, let's find a way to do that. I mean, that's, uh, uh, you know, if you look at the SRC report that uh, we worked on a couple years ago, they talked about having 45 trillion sensors in, uh, in about 10 years around the, just for everything, right? Just sensors everywhere. And if all of those are just using a little bit of power and, and the data is being consumed somewhere and transmitted by some uh, channel, you know, that's power. And we need to uh, find ways just to, to reduce that. So are you, are you at all heartened by the hyperscalers like Amazon and Meta uh, committing to using renewable energy for their data centers by I believe 2030, 2035. That's a good step. I mean, that's a step in the right direction. I mean, I, I've seen uh, companies uh, advertising that they're, you know, public companies advertising that they're doing block, uh, blockchain, uh, Bitcoin mining using, uh, you know, renewable energy. And it's a, it's a strong selling point, right? Um, I still think there's a role for, for better architectures and specific architectures that, that can solve these problems just at lower energy costs. But at some point, you might want to ask the question, even if it's carbon neutral or, you know, decarbonized in some sense, do we really need to be having a third of the planet's power budget going into um, computing? Um, sure. Or whatever it would be, right? I mean, uh, the, you know, because you can, you can have too much of a good thing, right? I mean, it goes zero carbon, but we decide to have a, a million times more of our, you know, of power 
budgets going to computing, then we have to pave over more of the deserts with solar panels or put up more wind turbines or whatever we're going to mm -hmm. do. And it's, uh, it, you know, unless it's really helping people or helping us get to, you know, warp drive or something, you know, faster, it's not clear to me that it's, you know, has a positive social good, even if you might eliminate the impact on the climate, you might, uh, Agree. might cause other so rick your mention of all these social challenges and jeff your mention of all these sensors proliferating way outside of the data center and the cloud uh, sort of begs the question of how can hpc a be a solution for those social problems and and some new classes of problems and how can hpc get out of the data center way out there to provide services where the sensors are what is your perspective on that well, sure. Um, the you know the privacy security aspects are uh, the interesting. Part is it's pervasive, right? And so certainly people are are looking at everything from Amazon dots being in everyone's home to uh, uh, different types of surveillance cameras uh, that are you know looking for people's faces in the crowd. Um, that's a really challenging problem. Uh, you know, DOE doesn't work that much in that space in HPC, for example, but there are certainly uh, you know, encryption techniques and, and people looking at things like homomorphic encryption that can make that something easier to do. Um, I'm, I think that's a challenge, and, and I think it goes in hand in hand with the uh, provenance information uh, that, that Rick alluded to, where, you know, you don't know who to trust, right? You're getting all this information. Uh, you're not sure where it's coming from, and there, there really need to be some fundamental uh, tech, and I think there's some opportunities for some new technologies to try to help in that space. Although that's not, you know, not something we're working on uh, here at Oak Ridge. It also could be, I mean, to your point, Jeff, it could be that we just need to figure out what kind of world do we want to live in and then build that world rather than right. uh, the random walk that we're in now or what appears to be the random walk. Uh, I mean, do we want a world that uh, you're centralized you know, 24 seven, hundred percent of the time. I mean, some people might like that some people might not. Um, but what, what, you know, at some point, these are all decisions. I mean, as humanity becomes more powerful, we create the world we want or create, you know, any world that we can imagine. Well, what's the world that we imagine that would be good? <laughs> and let's Agreed. put our energy you know, towards that. Um, now, you know, one thing that might be possible is that with, you know, with the evolution of the metaverse or omniverse, whatever flavor of the verse you want to talk about, people could explore alternative realities. And then maybe we have some ability to figure out what's the reality we actually want. Um, there's a downside to that too, that everybody just becomes a head mounted display uh, <laughs> you know, hanging on the wall. I've had enough of that the past two years. I want to meet people. Me too. I, I <laughs> I mean, I want to be out there in the real world and exactly you know, having the wind on my skin and the rain on my back, you know. Um, but, you know, I, I think in this exercise, there's also some neutral things that were on the list that are, are quite uh, maybe compelling even. I mean, I, I think we're going to see some really beautiful computer architectures emerge um, that we just get the right balance of high performance and AI mm -hmm. acceleration and we you know, maybe get to forget legacy a bit and, or at least imagine that we have an inter, uh, mm -hmm. APIs or, or virtual ISAs that are beautiful and that we can, uh, these machines become easier to reason about and easier to program. Um, you know, I used to tell my architecture students, you know, back in the, when airplanes were first invented, they were really hard to use. <laughs> um, but using an airplane you know, like a 787 or something is really easy to use. I mean, uh, and so just because we get bigger and, and more powerful things doesn't mean they have to become harder to use or harder to uh, manage in some sense. It, it, you know, it's a choice, right? Um, and I think with the uh, freedom that we'll get with, you know, not really giving up on Moore's law entirely, but you know, going 3D and other things where the where the frontier is going to be in design and, and architecture and, and um, 
we might have a chance to reinvent you know, HPC and reinvent the hybrid of HPC and AI in a way mm -hmm. that solves fundamentally what often are friction points. And if we're going to do that, we need a lot more young people to get, you know, kind of fascinated by this field right. and, the, and the relationship between computer architecture and science and AI and systems. And I view that as the, the thing that, you know, we all need to help. Well, in, in it, in, in, in a way, I, today's announcement from uh, HPE, their, uh, their AI de machine learning development system, it, it stri hits on a lot of the themes that you're talking about, Rick. So certainly that looks like an area, a direction the vendors are, are going to be going in. Michael, how about you? Do you have thoughts in this area of balanced systems that are more usable, that uh, take some of the complexity out or more balanced? Sorry, sorry, my daughter was playing the violin and you probably would not want to hear it. Um, yeah, it's 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 difficult to say what is going to happen in 2030 with respect to that. But uh, what I what I would like to add is that um, yeah, it's true that that the HPC um, has a, a downside, and yeah, it's true that uh, supercomputers are what I keep calling for several years now weapons of mass destruction. Um, and I keep telling my staff to to, to consider this and to, to be careful with what they're doing there. Um, that the question for, for me is is not whether uh, technology is is uh, say the culprit here uh, and, and we should be aware of that. We, we started to discuss this with philosophers and, and social scientists and political scientists about uh, six, seven, eight years ago, something like that. We have a special working group on that in our center. And we just have to find out is there is there anything that is particularly new about that? And the answer is yes. And then we have to ask ourselves, is there anything that is particularly uh, standard about that? And also the answer is yes. Like um, when you look at the history of uh, printing books or uh, printing leaflets and things like that, you, you realize that they triggered a revolution and that uh, pretty much everybody all of a sudden could print leaflets. Um, and, and then we, we try to find out uh, how we can handle that. And uh, keep in mind that um, sort of a certified truth in that sense only exists for probably 150 years or something like that uh, there, there is a time when we when, when we know that we cannot trust newspapers there is a time when we know that we can now can trust newspapers because there are standards there are procedures there is sort of a, a control by the general public that, that, that double checks what is happening there and what is written on the newspapers we will find ways to do that also in the future i mean uh, we will we will be able to handle that. Uh, we don't know yet how we are going to handle that, but uh, we can build on what we did over the last uh, 150 years. And I'm, I'm very uh, optimistic about uh, the social sciences, political sciences, and I'm optimistic that we find enough technical people uh, to work with these guys and, and to sort out such that they understand, the humanities understand what we are talking about, and, and we understand what they are talking about. So I'm, I'm too optimistic probably about HPC. Uh, <laughs> although I, I kept predicting that uh, World War III will be started by a supercomputer who by accident or voluntarily or on purpose uh, decided to flood the internet with some stupid piece of information that would <laughs> enrage all the people. But I'm still optimistic. I think we, we should be able to handle these things somehow. Yeah, and, and you know, I thought that's that's great and and rick your point about hard airplanes being hard to use and now they're so much of the operation of an airplane is automated and you see that in in our technology as well where the first generation is really for specialists but then there's kind of this yin and yang where the usability and accessibility comes in sure. so and, and, yeah i mean like for example you know we Know, maybe 20 years ago we could we had a notion of things like cloud computing but we didn't have a notion of it being as easy as it is now and, and these super rich you know software environments um 
and com whole companies building companies on top of each other, you know, to make that environment even richer and richer. So, you know, there, there's some basis for optimism here. I, I like Michael's uh, general spirit. Gen generally, I'm a super optimist. Um, it was just Doug prompted us to talk about the negative, so we had to think about it. Um, but <laughs> sorry, you know, Rick. No, no, it's all fine. <laughs> you know, you know, it's, it's what well, we're just entering. You know, we're in this realm where, if we can imagine it, we can kind of make headway towards it. And if we imagine dark things, then that's where we'll go. If we imagine good things, light things, we can go there. And we just have to, um, you know think about what we really want and, and, uh, and move the whole community in that direction. Um, and, you know, the technology is really a, uh, not an end in itself, right? It's, it's, uh, you know, we all love it and it's fun, but, um, mm -hmm. it's not the end goal. Right. And I, I think what HPC is about is enabling super powerful end goals. And that's what you, you brings everybody together. Right. So, we just have to keep that process alive, you know, imagining these super powerful end goals and, and build towards that and navigate all the nonsense that will happen on the way. Yeah, I think I'm an optimist too. I always, I, I, just, I look at all technology as always in its infancy. We're going to go so far, but part of my optimism is I believe we will be able to overcome these potential uh, real dangers as well um, and staying ahead of Staying ahead of the bad guys, if you will. Right. Yes. Remember, it's just it's just that other part of your personality that's not yours, but you know, somebody <laughs> collectively. <laughs> yeah. It, it depends on what you think about, right? I mean, is, are, are we in early days of humanity, and early days of humanity's uh, you know tangle with technology, or are we in the end times? And I think we're in the early days. So. Oh, well, great! This discussion, so I like it because. We, we've kind of converged the um, social sciences talking in, in, a, in a technology uh, context, as Michael was just saying. So I like it. <laughs> uh, all right, everybody. Uh, any other final thoughts from anybody you'd like us to, to drop in? Well, this is lots of fun, Doug. Keep doing them. Okay, very good. Well, thank you to everybody. I want to thank uh, Shaheen and Rick, Jeff, and Michael for this discussion, and um, we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thanks.